Well, here we are for life lessons, and I'm so sorry that uh, Brother Paul Camacho is not feeling well. We need to continue to remember him in prayer. I'm going to uh, kind of continue what we began with our morning Sunday morning study this morning, and I trust that you will follow along as we study God's Word from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19 to 26. Uh, we're talking about God's using people and how He uses them. And so I'm going to ask you to turn uh, to 2 Timothy 2, verses 19, and we're going to read it together as soon as we bow for a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have of studying your word. Thank you that you have made it possible and preserved the word of God so that we can open it, study it, compare Scripture with Scripture, understand the truths, allow the Holy Spirit to actually be the teacher. I pray that right now, as I seek to do my best, that you would take the feeble efforts and help us to understand the principles and the truths of your willingness to use human beings to accomplish the great task of telling others of what Jesus Christ has done and how he has made it possible for them to have eternal life and also hope and confidence in this life. Guide and direct us as we study, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to try to work all of the things that I have here uh, in front of me and uh, try to get it so that uh, we can uh, continue with uh, the, the reading and the study of the Word of God. So we're going to look uh, at the passage of Scripture and begin reading. Nevertheless, the foundations of God standeth sure. Having this, having this, notice, very important, seal. God has sealed it. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the same, out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. We're going to notice the kind of people that God can use. What are the kinds of people that God desires to use? And, and it is a, a use. God wants to use us. You remember I talked about the man, the pastor, who said, I don't want to be um, used. But in actuality, we all want to be used. If we're saved, we should have the desire to be used of God. It's not a burden, but a privilege to be used of God. And here in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, we find that the apostle actually gives five names for the Christian. Five names for the Christian. First of all, a son. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
a son. Are you a son? Have you been born into the family of God? Now, Paul used the word a son in a very, very kind way so that he could communicate that he had a relationship with Timothy, and he called him his son. But more important than be a son, than being a son or being a follower or a, 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 a protege of the Apostle Paul, we should be the sons of God. And we are told in the scriptures that we become the sons of God by faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, he says, and he calls him, he calls him a soldier in verse 3, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. A soldier is one who goes into battle, and we have to realize that in the world in which we live, we do live in a battle. We are living in a battle between forces of right and forces of wrong. And God says, you better learn to endure hardness, difficulties as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He continues then, and he says, further, you are a sufferer, <laughs> a sufferer. Oh, we don't like that. But in verse 12, the apostle said to Timothy, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Now, this suffering is reigning concept. It's not whether you will be accepted as a, as a son any longer, because once you're born into the family of God, you are a son forever. You cannot lose that relationship. But he's talking here about the fact that there are blessings to be received if we suffer with him, we'll also reign with him. Remember that. If we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us, not that we are sons, but he will deny us the blessings of reigning with him to the extent that he would like for us to be in his reigning. Then number four, we're a student in verse 15, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're a student. This is the reason why we use the scriptures and study the Bible so much here at Faith Baptist Church. This is why we encourage you to read and study your Bible every day. This is why we give you a daily study guide to review things, to go over things, to help us all become what we should be, and that is a good student, not being ashamed, and the purpose is what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth needs to be studied. Then he says, you're a servant. In verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. In other words, stop trying to, to defend yourself, but he says, be gentle to all men, apt to teach and patient. <laughs> Boy, that's kind of hard in the world in which we live. But these five things are so important that we should uh, monitor them in our lives. We should guard them in our lives. And we should be aware that God is saying, I want you to be this kind of a person. And this is the kind of a person that I will use the kind of a person that God uses. First, we notice it's a walking person, one that walks with God. In Proverbs 18, verse 24, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. <laughs> and you know what that basically means? It says, 
that if we're going to be have God as our friend, we have to be his friend. If we want this person to be our friend, then we better be friendly to that person. If we want this person to be our friend, we better be friendly to that person. But the same truth holds that if we want to be friends with God, we better be friendly with him. And it goes on, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Brothers sometimes fight. Brothers sometimes get into it with each other. This simply means that we're walking hand in hand with God. We're walking hand in hand with God, and this requires a faithful walk as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Steadfast, unmovable. That's the work that we're talking about. God says, I want you to be steadfast. I want you to be able to walk with me continually, recognizing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. There's another one then that follows, and that is a fruitful walk, a walk that is fruitful, a walk that is faithful, a walk that is friendly, and a walk that is fruitful. Enoch was that kind of a walker. He walked by faith. He was translated because he walked with God. He was not found. God had translated. God had taken him. God had pulled him up into heaven, for he had this testimony. What? that he pleased God. In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24, it says, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, because God took him. Enoch walked with God, and he just went on to heaven on that day. I just can't imagine it. I, I just think that God and Enoch were having such a good time of fellowship that God finally just said, hey, buddy, just, just come on home to heaven with me. And you know what? That's really the way our life should be. This past week, this past week, the funeral of my son, Philip, uh, my, my son, Philip's father-in-law, let me clarify that. Philip uh, uh, is married to Kay Ann, and Kay Ann's father passed away at the age, I think, of 85. And uh, when they began to explain all of this, it was like he was not for God took him. He was ready to go, and he just walked on to heaven. I'm so thankful that we have these opportunities. Then we notice the next thing it is a worshiping person, a worshiping person, one that will worship God scripturally. Oh, did you get that? Scripturally, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He's a spirit. We can't worship any other way. There's another thing that we have to realize. We have to worship him spiritually not just scripturally. God is the Spirit, we said. We must worship Him in what? In truth. In truth. Oh, that's important. Truth must be a part of our worship. The Word of God, the truth of God, is what we need to realize. And worship Him in truth. So there are so many people today who say they're worshiping God, but they're so far away from the truth, folks. The truth is found here, and if you're worshiping some way that is not found in the Word of God, it's not going to be proper worship. God wants our worship. He wants us to be able to worship Him, walk with Him, 
and worship properly. And he says, I want it to be sacrificially. In Genesis 25, uh, 22, verse 5, we find Abraham says to the young men, he's with his son. He is headed for a place that God has told him to go to, and they are told, you just stay here with the ass, the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and will come again to you. What was he doing? He was taking his boy. He was taking his a product of his own body. He was bringing this to God. God had said, I want an offering. But you know what? When he took his son as an offering, he was taking all of his dreams. He was taking all of his hopes. He was taking all of his desires. And that's the way true worship is. It's sacrificial. I'm afraid that in these days of the COVID and the separation, and you know, it used to be that that we kind of sacrificed getting ready to go to church. I don't know about you. Do you go to church in your under in your in your nightwear, in your uh, leisure clothes, or how do you go to church? I remember one time I was preaching and I had. Uh, my lesson was a little bit short that Sunday. And I had a lady walk up to me and she said to me, Pastor, I did not like your message. <laughs> and I thought, oh, wow. Generally, you hear in the Philippines, you know, we don't, we don't do that. We don't come that direct to the pastor. And uh, she came to me and she said, I didn't like your message. And I said, Mom, what what's the reason? Why didn't you like my message? And she looked at me and she said, I didn't like your message because it was only 20 minutes long. I walked one hour to come to church and you only taught us for 20 minutes. <laughs> and I said, oh, my, that was a sacrifice to walk an hour to get to church. I wonder if we realize that in our day and time, all we have to do is fix our gadget and, and here we hear a message. I wonder if we're truly understanding what God is telling us. You know, there's another thing. There's a submissive worship. In 2 Chronicles 7 verses 1 through 3, it was the time when Solomon was dedicating the temple, and it, it, it reads in verse 1 of 2 Chronicles 7, now when Solomon had made an end to praying, the fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. I wonder, where's God's house today? I don't mean a building. I'm not talking about some building. No. The Lord's house is the assembly of God's people. My heart is heavy. I have to tell you, I really, really struggle. It's nice to be able to talk with you like this and share God's Word and open the Word of God and, and teach and, and fellowship once in a while, virtually. <laughs> but you know what? Don't you long for the filling of the Lord's house as we would sing and as we would join together? You know, it continues there in verse 3. It says this, when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Can I? Maybe I shouldn't, but I'm going to share with you. I'm going to share with you the fact that 
sometimes I think we don't worship properly. I've been in churches where uh, after or during a song time, everybody is standing for 30 minutes. <laughs> and when they get done, everybody says, let's give the Lord a praise. <sighs> And I think, boy, they didn't do that. When the Lord filled his house, they bowed down. They didn't stand up. They bowed down to worship. God wants to walk with us. He wants to fellowship with us. There's a walking. There's a worshiping. Now, I want you to notice there is a willingness. There is a willingness. What do we mean? Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 said, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, said me. You see, when we hear the voice of God, God wants us to say, yes, here am I, send me. This means that there is a standing. In other words, stand up and be counted. There is a standing. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand, <laughs> he continues. Having done all to stand, stand. He wants us to stand for him. He wants us to give to him all of our heart. No, we have to understand, as we said a moment ago, when Paul was writing Timothy in chapter 1 and verse 12, he continued with this and he said, you know, there's a suffering. A willing person is willing to suffer. Paul said, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, nevertheless, he says, I am not ashamed. Sometimes people are ashamed to suffer. But he says, I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. There's a standing, there's a suffering, and there's also a serving. In Joshua 24, as Joshua had led the people into the land to claim their inheritance, he calls them as he gives his final admonition. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you, to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. There's a serving. And then, friend, there is a separating, a willing person, as Isaiah said, I'll go, I'll go here, I'll go there, I'll do what God wants me to, go, to, to do, I'll be in the place God wants me to be. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Do we fully understand what Paul is trying to get across here? Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And what does he say? I will receive you. I want to be received by God. I do. 
in order to be received by God, we must be separated from some things. So we've seen a walking person. We've seen a worshiping person. We've seen a willing person. I want you to notice a weeping person. A weeping person is one that is found in Psalm 126, verse 6. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I'm going to suggest that we should weep. We should weep for the sick. For the sick, whether it's easier, Jesus said, to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or say, arise, take up thy bed and walk. Jesus had said, your sins are forgiven you to the man who had palsy, and they didn't like that. But Jesus was showing that he was interested in people who were sick, but it wasn't the sickness of the body as much as the sickness of the soul. The second thing that he says is that we should also weep for the saints. Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 11 says, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. Uh, boy, this is a verse of Scripture that we could stay at for a long time. God says, I want to work in your life in a powerful way. I want to work in your life in the saints' lives. I want you to understand, Paul said, that God wants to work in you. He wants to accomplish things in you, and we sometimes fail to see that. The third part is the sinner. Paul writes in Romans 9, verses 1 through 3, these very interesting words. He's so burdened for the Jewish kinsmen that they would come to know Jesus. He says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish myself accursed. I could wish myself accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Oh, that we would have the desire for the loss that he did. We can see from his writing that his burden for the lost was so great. It was so great. In fact, he even said in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, he said, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by some man, uh, means, I might by some means save some. We've talked about a walking person that God can use, a fellowshipping person, a willing person, a weeping person, and now a working person. In Ephesians chapter 4, uh, 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto, with a purpose for good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He says, this is what we're made for. This is why we are here on this earth. And the call to Timothy is there in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. 
Do we understand that God has a plan, and that plan is for each one of us to be a part of his workmanship, creating his work in and through us? Let me share this with you. There are some types of Christians, they say. There's an elevator Christian. You got to push buttons to get any action out of them. There's a lot of movement, but not much progress. These elevator Christians, they carry a few, but not too many. And generally, you have to wait for their arrival. Some are fast and some are slow. But you know what? An elevator Christian is totally dependent on outside power. Another type of Christian was a Ferris wheel Christian. You know, those big Ferris wheels like we have up there in, in Tagaytay. Goes high, has fun, but just has to stay in one place. Goes in circles all the time. Totally dependent on outside power. Near where we are living, about 35 miles away, there's a, there's a nice wonderful place to go and spend the day. They have a roller coaster. Have you been on roller coasters? Some Christians are like roller coasters. They go up and they go down. They're on track. They're fast, but generally there's lots of screaming and drama going on, and they're all dependent on outside power. They have to get up speed, but you know what? In reality, they just are only self-propelled when they're going down. And they always end up at the same spot. Then there's an escalator Christian. An escalator Christian is kind of slow. You have to hold on if you ride the escalator. It makes some people nervous getting on it and off. It should be able to function even when external power is off but you have to walk it. Well, let's ask the question, folks. What kind of a person can God use? What kind of a person can God use? A walking person? Are you walking with God? Are you in fellowship with him? Are you like Enoch? Would God say, just come on? It's not a bad thing, by the way. Are you a worshiping person? Are you worshiping God properly, scripturally? Are you a willing person? Are you someone that God can trust? Are you a weeping person? Do you weep for the lost? And last, are you a working person allowing God to be working in you? As we close out today, I trust that you will say, I want God to be my strength for being the person that he can use. I want him to use me by being in me, working through me, and touching the lives of people around. What a wonderful, wonderful study to really understand that God wants to use us, and he's given us the rules and the regulations and the patterns in the scripture on how we can serve him and be a blessing. Father, thank you for the privilege of studying your word today. I pray that you would take our lives and use them and help us to be all that we can be as we run the race for you today. Bless those who are ill, encourage those who are discouraged, and I pray above all that each one of us would focus our eyes on Jesus Christ, for he is our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us. I'll see you next Sunday right here again at 915 at Faith Baptist Church, South Metro. It's Pastor Hoagie saying bye-bye for now.